Welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. This podcast brings you enlightening discussions with leading experts and public figures directly to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. Today, I have a fantastic guest, as always, a very dear friend of mine, an inspiration, a superwoman, a mother, and many, many, many other things she's doing, Brittany Kaiser, all the way up in the US at the moment. How are you, Brittany? I am so good, Tessie. It's such a pleasure to finally be here. I feel like this has been a long time coming, and there's so many exciting things going on in our lives right now that I'm looking forward to talking it through. That's fantastic. Thank you for your time. I know you're very busy and uh, this is really, this is a big treat. We have been planning this for more than a year and I'm so happy it finally happened. (laughs) Absolutely, me too. So um, just a little note, I am breastfeeding right now. If baby is getting a little bit unease, my mom is next to me. I will just pass him over to my mom. She will go outside and then we continue just in case he's fine for now. But just in case, but you know, as a mom yourself, you know, we're, we're working moms. We do what we need to do, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's juggling at all times, but so worth it. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Brittany, your first political campaign at the age of 13 in Chicago, then fast forward up to 2018, Cambridge Analytics, and now an advocate for Own Your Data. Brittany, what a life. Tell us about that. Tell us about how did you get into politics at such a young age? What what inspired you? And what could you say to our young listeners here to do the same, if they want to do the same? For me, I feel like from childhood, I've always been incredibly passionate about social justice, Uh, whether it was something about the environment, animals, human rights, really political campaigns and issues-based advocacy has always been something that's been incredibly inspiring to me because you can so easily change something that you see to be unjust. And so uh, a lot of people might be surprised when they hear, you know, the first campaign I worked on was when I was 13. Well, that's when I took my first trip down to Costa Rica, where it was the first time I was told about how the banana plantations and the the types of pesticides that were being used were negatively affecting indigenous communities, especially. And so I I came back to Chicago and I did an entire campaign actually banning Dole and Chiquita products in schools and making sure that schools were procuring more organic products for kids. Uh, I was a kid myself at the time, but I felt incredibly strongly about it because These were the companies that I had especially been shown when I was in the country were were having or causing a lot of issues. And so I was successful in my campaign. There was no more Dolor Chiquita in my school or most private schools around Chicago. Even the public schools took hold of some of this and started ordering more organic products for kids, which I'm very passionate about now as a mom. I even believe in it more. So I love how that was kind of my first Uh, avenue into politics, so to say. And it was only about a year and a half later that I decided to volunteer on my first presidential campaign, which was for uh, Howard Dean when he was running in the primaries. Then I joined and volunteered for John Kerry, who was also running for president. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've worked on uh, seven presidential campaigns, actually, both for Democrats, Republicans, and an independent. So I, I've definitely kept that up <laughs> for not just the United States. I suppose I, I've probably worked on, you know, 20 uh, other campaigns in countries around the world. And that's how I found myself at a company you've probably heard of uh, called Cambridge Analytica. I was trying oh, to I'm become... I'm not sure. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I was uh, really trying to become the best campaigner I could. Instead of going really full-time into politics, I decided to train as a human rights lawyer um, when I went to college and university. And uh, four degrees in human rights law and international law in, I found that the only way that I could really be incredibly successful at what I was trying to do was to master tools with technology, especially data-driven prediction technologies. 
and that that was the best way that I could engage in human rights, helping build preventive technologies so that you could use data to prevent crises, prevent war, prevent famine before it happened. Mm -hmm. And that's really all about data. So I joined Cambridge Analytica thinking this is going to make me the most successful campaigner and human rights activist that I could possibly be. Uh, I think I got a little more um, over my head than I expected to in the data world and quickly learned that not everyone uses uh, data and campaigning for positive outcomes. So in 2018, I became a whistleblower and on the data industry especially, and that has allowed me to actually continue or even amplify my global advocacy efforts. Now, instead of just human rights, it's data as human rights or data as property rights and increasing mm -hmm. transparency and ownership and accountability in the way that technology works, really making technology and ethics uh, become one of the most important topics around the world. And so that that's really been my career for for a while it's just uh what topic am i concentrating on is it the environment is it a particular political candidate is it human rights is it data rights uh but i feel like i've i've been an advocate my entire life for causes that i believe in and that's really what has driven me you can see the impact you're making and that's what makes all of this work which is sometimes paid but a lot of times pro bono <laughs> it makes it worth it yeah, no, for sure. Wow, what what a timeline! It's really incredible. For the for the Cambridge Analytics Analytica, um, you know, also as a woman uh, whistleblower, as you mentioned, uh, how was that for you? Because you were you not scared? You know, we have seen from other whistleblowers what happened to them, right? And uh, you know, I'm sure that there's people also listening in who probably also know some skeletons in the closet of their own companies, and they are probably scared to death to come out because yeah you just don't know what is on the other side but you know it's wrong right what is happening there at the moment so how was that for you and how did you even take that decision where you said okay I need to do this and what was the what was the aftershock for that what happened to you then so I, I'm so glad you asked me that because I definitely would say it was the scariest decision I've ever made uh, the best comparison that I can really give is it's as if you're going to jump off a cliff without knowing if your parachute works or even if you have a parachute in the first place because you don't know what's going to happen and you can't predict it but when I was younger still at boarding school I was learning about whistleblowing in my first journalism class that I ever took fast forward to when I'm studying as a human rights barrister in the UK and WikiLeaks drops the Iraq war files. And I'm writing specifically about war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and some of the documents, the primary source documents that came from whistleblowers was the first time that I was actually able to have primary sources in some of the work that I was doing. Um, I had done human rights research. And again, that's that's almost third party um, or at least secondary uh, sources. And so when you're trying to do this type of work and all of a sudden you have access to the types of files that show you how some of these crimes were committed, mm -hmm. I thought that whistleblowing was probably the single most important thing that could be done to hold power accountable. And I felt very strongly about that and really, I suppose was was very emotional about whenever I saw a public whistleblower came out. Um, and so many people around the world, when they decide to do something like that, decide to stay private. And that's because you don't know what the repercussions are going to be. Mm -hmm. At minimum, you're going to lose your job because you're probably quitting at the same time. <laughs> you might be blacklisted from your entire industry or multiple industries mm -hmm. and have trouble ever getting a job again. But what you see with a lot of whistleblowers is that you might lose your privileges of travel. You and your family might be targeted. You might be falsely imprisoned for political motives. And so really it can get as bad as that, even a lot of whistleblowers are killed for the information that they brought to light. So it's not something that a decision that can be made lightly. 
And so I feel that there are people around the world working, especially in some of the world's largest technology companies. Mm -hmm. I've seen some very bad things happening around them, maybe not just in their team, but in the effects of the tools that they're deploying, or it could be within governments or militaries. And they're going to decide not to bring that to light because of the fear of repercussions. So what I, I really learned through my whistleblowing process was that the support for whistleblowers that exists, both legally and politically mm -hmm. uh, and on the advocacy side, is one of the most important things that could be worked on around the world to help hold systems accountable. If you can protect whistleblowers and make sure that if someone has evidence of wrongdoing and they decide to share that with yep. either the higher ups in their company or their organization or with lawyers or advocates or journalists, that these people can be protected. That is one of the most important things that we can do as a society to say, if you see something, say something. Uh, you, you probably hear that phrase a lot in, in Northern, regards yeah. to, you yeah. know, terrorism in airports, yeah, right? Crime, exactly. <laughs> and see so it, it, say it, uh, yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. There's always those phrases that are kind of encouraging people that if you see something that might be wrong, it, it, it's better to bring that to someone's attention so that a problem can be solved as opposed to waiting for it to get worse. And um, so I really do feel like um, it will always be a part of my life to help support other people who are in that situation because my case was so public and I became such a well-known public person around the world for becoming a whistleblower. I have people come to me all of the time that say, hey, I know of some wrongdoing. Can you help me? And luckily I can point them to the right lawyers or the right people that can give them the advice that they need to either bring the attention to a government agency or at least within their own company to deal with it first. Um, so I, I think those systems can be made better. And it's important that we all consider that as an important part of accountability in the world. No, for sure. And it definitely inspires me to some extent without going into the detail because um, this podcast is obviously about your story. But me privately, you know, with uh, my divorce and my ex-family-in-law, there's there's definitely some stuff to be told as well, some stories. But, you know, um, I was not as brave as you are to say I'm going to come out and tell the story and what is happening behind closed doors, right? So I really admire your courage for it because um, I think that it's important. It is really important um, to have leaders and inspirations such as yourself. Uh, making a change you know I do I, I of course I make my own change in my own ways and I decided not to come out with certain things but um, at the same time you know it's just as we are moving into the data the data communities more and more you know the metaverse now and all of these these boundaries are being crossed now it comes into you know it's everywhere I think it's really important that as you say you know there needs to be some protective laws for people to come out because the system needs to be regulated as well and if the system can regulate itself properly and the laws protect these people because it's nothing wrong with that then um, I certainly as a mother feel more confident for my children to use these things as well right Because we're talking yeah, Facebook, absolutely. right? When when we're talking about the Trump campaign, how he used Twitter and Facebook and things like that, we're talking about other political leaders as well, right? And um, then, uh, yeah, well, you are you are more of the expert in that than I am, than I ever will be. So, um, as a woman, then, right? I think you're just so incredible um, talking about own your data and everything. What would you say? Um, are the five key things someone individually, firstly, should be aware of when we're talking about own your data? What are the five top tips from you as an expert to protect us? So my first in terms of digital literacy awareness is to start to make some of these topics approachable. So many people have technology in their daily lives And we might know how to use technology, but we're not informed on how technology works. And that is on purpose. <laughs> If when we were in school, we were taught 
instead of just how to send an email or how to use a search client, that everything that we typed could be recorded and was likely going to be kept in millions of databases around the world with the data that we were searching for always connected to us and that that would inform our entire digital life and experience because that historical data would always be connected to us as individuals. I think we would have started using technology in a much different way <laughs> than we do today, but we were not informed. We did not have the actual information in order to make an educated choice about how we use technology. So really my first tip for everyone is to start to become more aware of the decisions that you're making every single day and how technology that you're using actually works. So first is to really do a little bit of an audit of what you do on a daily basis. For instance, how many applications are on your phone? <laughs> now, how many of those applications do you actually use every day? Perhaps at least 60 to 70% of the apps you have on your phone, you hardly ever use. But if you look at the terms and conditions that you signed on those apps, they you are probably you giving... Second, right? <laughs> right. You're probably giving those companies and their development team access to your photos, your videos, your microphone and turning on your camera, maybe 24-7, even when you're not using the app, mm -hmm. access to your live location, information that you're producing in other apps, et cetera, and so forth. And then you start to realize the gravity of the problem. So really just taking into account the, the beginnings of that awareness and thinking, okay, well, you know, could I delete, you know, at least five or 10 apps straight off the bat, <laughs> ones that I downloaded two years ago to read a menu in a restaurant or mm -hmm. to check into an airline that I'm never going to take again or, or something like that and, and start to really do that own due diligence. If you read terms and conditions, this is always number two for me, um, read the terms and conditions of one of the apps that you don't use so often and start to see if you feel comfortable still giving that amount of data and access to your personal life to a company where you don't really use their services. I really think that's when you're going to start to not just clean up the apps on your phone, but really you start to take account of your digital life and what you are comfortable with giving away. I, I know it's not easy to understand all of the terms and conditions. Of yeah, course, you probably have to be a technology so lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Intellectual property lawyer and stuff like that. <laughs> to really get it. And, and that's one of the bigger issues, of course, that I've been working on on the legal and regulatory side. But I think that it's important for people to start to try to engage. You, you might not have time to read 40 or 50 pages of it, but start to read it and you'll really understand the gravity of the problem of what you allow to happen to you by not reading the terms and conditions. Um, so uh, the next would be besides, you know, creating more awareness in your life, next reading the terms and conditions and doing that due diligence. The next I would say is you, you've now reached a point where, where you're gaining more transparency over what's going on in your digital life. So start to care more about permission structures. Besides deleting the apps that you don't want to have access to your data, mm -hmm. look in your settings, perhaps not just the settings in your phone, but the privacy settings, if you happen to have accounts like Facebook or Google, and take your time to go through one by one and actually understand understand what each of those settings mean, try to understand it, and then make an educated decision on, on what you would like to do. Mm -hmm. And so those permission structures are incredibly important. Um, besides the permission structures, then you need to start to think a little bit further about what platforms you're actually comfortable using. So for instance, even before I worked at Cambridge Analytica, I never installed any uh, Facebook apps on my phone for the past, you know, 10 years or so. That's because I read the terms and conditions and decided I didn't want that app to have access to all of that data on my phone, but I still do have an account. I log in on a private window on my laptop using a VPN. I log in and I can check my Facebook. 
I actually haven't done that in nine months and I'm very proud (laughs) to have not used Facebook in nine months. But uh, that's the first time in my life that I decided to take a break. Normally, I would log in for the rest of my life since college and use it privately where it doesn't have access to all of the data in my phone, like live location and pictures and contact books and Mm -hmm. access to my microphone. Um, So it's really taking action once you have that awareness, once you have decided more on the permission structures that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. deciding to implement some of that into your daily life. Um, And I would really say the one thing that is probably the best for your physical and mental health in all of this is screen time management. Mm -hmm. So my husband does that. I think everyone, yeah, everyone can benefit from that, especially families. But having time in your day, in your evening, where you don't use technology, having time within your annual schedule where you take a week or two off technology, whether it's over Christmas and New Year's or whether it's sometime over the summer when there's less work to be done, but taking that time for yourself. I mean, in the Jewish tradition, you you don't look from Friday night to Saturday night, right? So there's always this this lack of technology that allows you to really be present with other human beings to take time away from screens away from producing data for your own both mental and physical health i mean that's why everyone tends to bend forward because we're over our phones and our laptops all of the time and especially for children uh the way that a lot of the applications we're using uh actually consume their time and attention and are designed to be so addictive You need to make sure that that type of addictive behavior does not become something that takes over their lives when they need to be making friends and playing outside. They need to be paying attention to their academic studies or their Mm -hmm. sports and not constantly be drawn back into a phone or a device. Uh, And and that's really right. And I'm sure you've experienced this. You know, you now have uh, three boys that have, uh, I'm sure, varying levels of technology that they're yeah. using, but it's um, it, it's something that is so important and, and I think was going to be our main topic of conversation when we originally planned this over yeah. a year ago was just digital literacy and educating children and keeping children safe in the yeah. face of how technology works today. It's now not just children, it's everybody around the world um, now that we've spent a year and a half only leading a digital life not really having that in-person presence and mm-hmm. the ability to remove ourselves from screens. So now more important than ever is the last point, <laughs> which is the screen time management. Yeah, that's so important because I see it with my teenagers here. My boys, they go outside a lot still and they like to be in nature for sure. But as soon as they are on their phones, on their VRs, Oculus and all of that stuff, they get so aggressive when I take it away. I can get really, you know, it's almost like different people. And um, and I tell them, you know, hey, this is not good. You know, I would like to have you just for you to be with me. Like going to a restaurant without a phone is like right. war. <laughs> like sometimes it's really, it's really crazy to get them off because they're like, yeah, but my friends and here and there. Because as you said, for the last year and a half, that was their life. They had homeschooling from the computers eight, nine hours a day computer already enforced by the educational system right and then their phones and then they needed whatsapp with their friends because they were all home so obviously everyone needed to meet on the phone or house party or all of these things right so it was really yeah i'm trying to get them back off again now that we're starting to meet again in person but uh, boy it's difficult huh? so do you exactly. go to schools as well for example do you give um, do you give speeches in schools as well Absolutely. Um, so there, there's a variety of things I do on the education side, not just doing kind of road shows to a lot of big conferences, doing keynotes and talks about this, but at, at universities, at high schools, and now really working a lot on a specific digital literacy program that's for elementary schools, uh, concentrating on eight to 12 year olds, which on average around the world is uh, when young people tend to get their own device, not a family device or something that belongs to their parents, but something that is wholly their own. And therefore concentrating on 
uh, young children before they get their first device or around the time they get the first device is when they should start learning some of these essential tools, you know, everything from what their own data rights are to some cybersecurity protocols of how to keep mm-hmm. your uh, your data and technology safe to countering cyberbullying and the screen time management topics. And all of that is just so important. And I wish we would have been taught those things when we were young, when we first had computer class, but we weren't. Yeah, no, for sure. And it wouldn't, if we would have had it, especially also some of the younger generations now, it could have saved a lot of lives. Because mm-hmm. suicide rates, all of that stuff because of cyberbullying is just nuts. You know, and I think I think it's great what you're doing. If I can help you in any way, you know. Um, I'm sure if the school of my kids listens to this, you know, they're probably like, Oh, can you ask Brittany to come to school? You know, I'm, I'm sure Absolutely. it's gonna come. But it's I'd be really, more than happy to every time. Every thank time. You so much. I think it's so important. So really count me in and whatever we can do as well. And, um, you know, I just created really a project, you know, from from moms as well, right? From moms to the kids, what can we do, right? I think um, that would be really interesting. But we are running out of time. We did big time now. Um, So my last question to you, because I know your little one is also waiting with your mom. And uh, he's going to wake up soon. He just fell asleep. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. Um, My last question that I ask all of my guests is, is there a book, is there a podcast that you would recommend where you would say, wow, this really inspired me. This is really fun. Um, This is really informative. Whatever it might be, something where you really were, it blew your mind, where people can say, huh, Brittany read that and that that blew her her mind or she listened to this. Now I feel I know her a little bit better. (laughs) Of course. So I I would say one of the most uh, inspiring books that you could read these days, if you especially care about the digital literacy topic, protecting children and empowering both parents and teachers to help young people protect themselves online, uh, is a new book called IQ, EQ, DQ. Mm -hmm. And it's about the digital intelligence quotient, uh, which is the new IEEE Uh, digital literacy standard around the world that public schools are starting to implement into the curriculum globally. And it's written by uh, Dr. Yuhyun Park, who is the person who originally founded the DQ Institute and over the past 10 years has led organizations around the world that are the top think tanks and universities and heads of ministries of innovation and technology to create what is an indicator set around digital intelligence. So you can have not just an IQ or an EQ, you can have a digital intelligence quotient, be able to measure that and be able to improve it. it. It's absolutely incredible on both the academic and practical side and gives you a lot of tools that you can use in your daily life, use in schools, use at home as a family. Uh, So I really would love for everyone that is specifically interested in this topic to check out that book, to also check out the DQ website, which is dqinstitute.org. And if you really want to delve into some of the topics to realize why this is so important, I I think my favorite technology um, podcast around technology and ethics is uh, Tristan Harris's podcast, him and Aza Raskin. Uh, who lead the Center for Humane Technology. They have a podcast, um, which I have been on before, and it really delves into a lot of the critical issues around how technology functions and how we can start to solve some of those problems. So the Center for Humane Technology, I believe, is um, uh, humanetech.org. And everyone should, should really definitely listen to that. Um, and I can't recommend enough. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased, but uh, if you do like uh, Netflix documentaries, both uh, my own, The Great Hack, as well as The Social Dilemma, which uh, uh, Tristan is one of the, the main faces mm-hmm. of, um, both of those documentaries together really encapsulate not just the problem, but um, some of the ways that we can start to solve some of those issues. So um, I, I'm just so thankful 
to be here. If you, uh, if anyone listening to this would like extra resources, my own foundation website, the Own Your Data Foundation is ownyourdata.foundation. Mm-hmm. I have links to all of the things I just mentioned on my own website, as well as extra resources talking about both data rights law and advocacy and how you can even get involved in uh, some of these uh, advocacy campaigns as well. So uh, I'd love to hear from any of you as well. If you want to write to us at info at ownyourdata.foundation, always happy to share our resources or help you get involved or find something to use in your own school or family at home. Wow, that's amazing. I think you're the first guest who gives me such amazing ideas at the end. You know, they all have always a beautiful book or a podcast, but you are just a pool of resources where you can just really dive in, right? And I appreciate it because it's such an important topic and it's an important that it's a topic that is central to all of us in some way or another. And uh, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for your time. For the wonderful people listening in, um, there's also a video on YouTube where you can see beautiful Brittany and you can see her when she talks, which I think is always nice because not everyone likes to listen to people, but they like to see your facial expressions. So there's a YouTube channel as well, Tessie Anthony Danasa on YouTube. And please subscribe, like, comment and rate so we can reach more people all around the world. Thank you, dearest Brittany. I speak to you offline a little bit more. And for everyone else, please get in touch with Brittany, as she mentioned, through her website. And do definitely use these resources. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Tessie. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for listening to this Zoom O'Clock. We hope this discussion was insightful and has provoked some new ideas for you. Please share and subscribe. If you'd like to keep in touch with your host, you can find her on Instagram under Tessie underscore from underscore Luxembourg and on Twitter under Tessie underscore DE.